Hello lovely people, my name is Emma and today I'm doing my wrap up for the second half of April and the first few days of May. So because Springathon is happening from May 4th to 17th, I've decided to include the first three days of May in this wrap up. I'll do a separate wrap up for Springathon and then that will function quite nicely as a mid month wrap up for May. And then I'll do one on the later half of May at the very end of the month. All a bit complicated, but I'm sure you follow what's going on. So I've already filmed a mid month wrap up that will tell you most of my reading for the first half of April and I'll link that down below. But this is for the second half. The Owls Readathon or Magical Readathon for the Owls is across the entire month and I did have a few books left over for specific prompts for um, that. So what I'll do is I'll just flag those books when they come up but because I'd done the majority of my Owls in the, in the first half of the month I kind of ignored my Owls TBR for the bulk of the second half and just kind of read whatever I was really looking, liking the look of on my bookshelves. The first book I finished was The Museum of Modern Love by Heather Rose. This is a contemporary romance of sorts and is basically um, looking at a particular um, performance art piece that was actually in real life. It is inspired by the work of Marina Abramovic who does feature in the book as like a fictional counterpart to her in the book that Heather Rose has researched. The performance piece was where Maria sat in a chair for a whole day across the course of like several, like I think it was about a month maybe even several months and basically strangers had the ability to come and sit across from her in a chair and not say anything Thing, but maintain eye contact for as long as they wanted to and it gathered an insane amount of press and interest from the general public in New York. This book is about that particular piece and a few people who end up encountering this performance piece and their interactions with it and how it helps to improve or kind of make a commentary on their life in some way. It was genuinely such a beautiful stunning piece of work. I really love the characters and character exploration. I thought the discussions on performance art and modern art and kind of contemporary work and what the purpose of it is was very very fascinating and the um, look it had in Mar to Marina's own life was also really fascinating because she's done a whole host of very intense performance pieces that this book does detail. I do think a passing knowledge of basic modern art and slash art history would be helpful because there are references to other pieces and other artists in here that it would be helpful to know a vague sense of kind of what's happened in the art world say for the past sort of 20 or 30 years or so. I'm not talking too in depth but if the name Giacometti means nothing to you or people of that similar ilk then this book potentially sections of it will go over your head. However it's quite short, it's really lovely read and has some amazing character work so I still recommend it anyway plus the cover is very cool. The next book I read was Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson and this did feature in My Owls, this was for Defence Against the Dark Arts, a book set at sea or by the ocean. So obviously this is an absolute classic. This particular um, book actually has a bind up including a short novella called The Ebb Tide at the end, which I did not get to. Unfortunately, despite the fact that I was super psyched for this book, uh, this is one where I really don't think it's worth reading the original text. Treasure Island, I was hoping for a major nostalgia hit because I really like pirates. I've loved all the movie adaptations I've seen of Treasure Island, but it really just left me wanting. The book was a combination of too fast paced in various areas where I really wanted to get to know the characters or really enjoy the action that we were experiencing and then ridiculously slow paced at random very boring parts that nobody really cared about. And it was a weird blend of the two where it just was the wrong pacing regardless of where we were in. I mentioned this in the end of my mid-month wrap up where I talked about what I was currently reading because I'd only just started it at that point and I said that I was really looking forward to seeing the relationship between Jim and uh, Captain Long John Silver at the beginning um, because there's like a betrayal there and I was hoping that we get to explore that over you know quite a few pages before the inevitable betrayal. However we really didn't get that it literally was all of a page or two before Long John Silver was revealed to be the bad guy that he is and that was really unfortunate to me because I thought that that was something that would have been far more fascinating. You know, movie adaptations are just far better, I think, in this particular case, which is why I didn't bother reading The Ebb Tide, because I really didn't want to have to put myself through that again. Um, so, yeah, unfortunate, that one. I did end up getting around to watching The Muppets Treasure Island, though. I watched it <laughs> streaming the DVD uh, via a Discord live stream to me and a few of my mates, and that was a really fun experience. So if you think about reading the book, just watch the, the Muppets version with Tim Curry instead. It's a thousand times better. The next book I read was Faker by Sarah Smith, and this was the last of kind of contemporary romance that I read in April. I was on a bit of a contemporary romance kick. This one the idea is that the main character is faking a very like tough girl persona working in a male-dominated industry and her colleague who she works close by with um, 
hates her for some apparent reason and then as it transpires probably doesn't hate her and it's kind of an enemies to lovers trope this was probably the weakest of all of the romance contemporary romances i read in april um mainly because it just didn't really have any plot um there was no other driving force beyond the relationship between the two main characters and it felt very forced at places um the the main female character kept talking about how she hated the fact that she had to fake being such like badass stone cold bitch at work the whole time but we never really got to see her interact with anybody else so her constantly being like oh i put on this tough persona and and said something bitchy and it was so unlike me really rang very hollow when we never got to see her outside of her bitchy persona that she was so unlike um the general kind of only real main sort of tension for the couple is a bit of a weird misunderstanding towards the end that I don't really like anyway. Um, as like a trope I think misunderstandings are a fairly flimsy plot device regardless of the genre that I put in and yeah the whole thing just fell very flat for me which is a real shame because I'd enjoyed quite a lot of the contemporary romances that I've been reading and this kind of killed that kick for me. It was definitely the weakest by far. I'm not completely off contemporary romance I'm definitely gonna read some more at some point in the future but this kind of uh yeah, mm, sealed just just ended that run for me let's shall we say the next one i want to talk about i don't know whether i should actually include it i don't know if it technically counts as a book it's an audible original called the grown-up guide to dinosaurs which was kind of more of a mini podcast series officially speaking it has three pages according to goodreads but it does have a goodreads listing and i enjoyed it so much that i don't really care that it doesn't have a print form of itself i'm going to include it here as the title suggests, it is a grown-up guide to dinosaurs with six individual episodes that are looking at various different aspects of dinosaurs and paleontology with the um, most up-to-date information that we have at the moment. It was really, really cool. It's got loads of interviews and kind of discussions with various uh, well-known paleontologists who are experts in their field. And it's looking at all sorts of things like the feather controversy, trace fossils, the extinction events, etc, etc. It really reinvigorated um, my desire to learn more about the area and it reminded me that I actually own several books on my bookshelf that were by the various paleontologists who we were talking to and it also included a few interviews from people who I have read their books as well so that was really cool and I think it would be a really great starting place if you're interested in reading more about dinosaurs and paleontology but not too sure where to begin and don't want to commit to a whole book. The whole thing was only like two and a half to three hours worth of audiobook I think um, and they were all in like half an hour bite-sized chunks so it made it really really easy listening. It genuinely felt far more like a podcast than anything else and because it does this wonderful bouncing into lots of different topics it's a really good way of finding out what areas of paleontology you personally would like to learn more about whether it is something like the feather controversy or trace fossils um so yeah i would 100 percent recommend it even though it's not technically a book but like who really cares the next one i read for the owls and i read it for arithmancy which was read a book that is outside of your favorite genre or a genre that you're comfortable with and i read the nakano thrift shop by hiromi kawakami translated by alison markin powell which was translated fiction which is why it's outside my favorite genre i'm trying to read more translated fiction this year this one really didn't make the mark for me. Um, this has probably been the uh, least enjoyable or engaging translated fiction I've read this so far this year. Um, it tells a tale of a young well, tells a tale of a woman who works at a thrift shop, and it is about her interactions with both the customers and some of her fellow um, employees, including a relationship and romance with one of the um, gentlemen who works there. But to be honest, it kind of bumbled along and didn't really do anything or say anything particularly interesting. And I really didn't like any of the main characters at all. Um, they were very bland and boring. And I especially didn't like the main male romance lead because he had absolutely no, not even like no redeeming qualities. He had no qualities whatsoever. He was one of the most like blank, boring, um, kind of clean slate characters I think I've ever come across in any literature. It's a real shame because I think Japanese literature, of which this is, um, has a tendency of doing that real like quiet beauty in the world and sort of importance of smaller objects and smaller moments etc etc and this is the second translated Japanese fiction book that I read in April that didn't land for me and I don't know if it's just that I'm not in the kind of headspace where I can really appreciate quiet beauty in the world right now and whether I need something a bit more fast paced and pl like plotty to really kind of grab my attention so it might just be that it was the wrong time to read this book um, with that in mind I have decided to bench a few of the translated fictions that I have on my shelf that are in this particular style and go for some of the slightly more genre translated fiction I have instead once Springathon is over um, so 
If you enjoy the quiet beauty of translated Japanese fiction, I would say definitely still give this a go because I do think it was doing that. I just don't think I could really appreciate it at that point. And none of the characters resonated at all. Like, and without that, a character driven book where you don't really care about any of them, it is a bit of a slog. The last book I read for my owls was a book with a beak on the cover. And I told you I was going to read a book for the Penguin English Library paperback collection because they have tiny little penguins on all of them. And this is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This was for my Care of Magical Creatures. I did complete all 12 owls. I don't know if I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, I was planning on reading Little Women, but honestly, I was kind of in a bit of a darker mood towards the later half of the month. So I thought the stormy atmosphere of Wuthering Heights would be much better. This has probably been the biggest surprise of the entire year for me reading wise, because I started Wuthering Heights at school when I was studying for, I believe my A-levels, and I never finished it because I hated it so much. I just could not get into any of it. And I think I barely got a third of the way through. Um, I just remember it being absolutely horrendous. Whereas this this time round, I devoured the audiobook in about four days. I was just so completely hooked on the world of Kathy and Heathcliff and the many other characters called Kathy and Heathcliff and Linton. Emily Bronte really needs to get more character names, that was slightly irritating, but beyond that it was fantastic. I think it really helped in this case to take the audiobook rather than to read it in physical form because the atmosphere that it created was fantastic. The narrator as well, I think it was Joanne Froggatt, um, but I will check and I'll comment down below. It was one of the audible versions of it. Um, basically, she did some really amazing accent work that really placed them in the kind of north of England. And I really enjoyed the epi epistolary nature of it being told um, not technically epistolary, sorry, but it being told from the servant's point of view. I thought that that was a fascinating twist on this kind of a tale. Um, Wuthering Heights is fairly well known. It's a very tortured love story between Kathy and Heathcliff that basically ends badly and then Heathcliff goes on to try and torture the next generation and it's all about um, love and violent love that is not good for either person. And I you know it was very revolutionary at its time but obviously we've we've done that quite a lot since then i enjoyed it i enjoyed the fact that i hated so many of the characters and i thought it was just so well told and so beautiful and atmospheric and really exactly what i was looking for in that moment so it fitted the bill just perfectly and has made me really like already i kind of thought that classics at school are probably not the best idea in the world but the amount that i've enjoyed this book compared to when i was reading it in my a levels is just absolutely mind-blowing the difference and it's really reinforced this idea that actually if you didn't like classics at school definitely don't write them off as an adult reader because I think you do need to come to them at a specific point both in life and in your reading and also something like Wuthering Heights I think I appreciated a lot of the the tropes and nuances of it more because I've kind of immersed myself in other classics that were for me personally easier to get on with from the beginning so I think that's something that is really worth bearing in mind whenever approaching any kind of classics that you kind of do need a bit of a backlog and you need to get almost get through the first few to kind of get a feeling for the writing styles so that you can kind of appreciate some of the the tropes that it's doing like with any genre and any new kind of area that you're trying to read there are going to be established protocols of what the writing is like that you need to get your head around to really get the most from it um, but i think something like this that is twisting some of those you need to know what it's twisting at the beginning if that made any sense at all um, but yeah amazing such a surprise like might be a new favorite classic the bronte sisters are two for two at the moment with me the next book i read was in the labyrinth of drakes a memoir by lady trent by marie brennan this is book four in the lady trent series um I've talked numerous times about the Lady Trent series on this channel. Um, if you're fairly new to it, basically it's um, a fantasy series, but it's almost like a, a nature writing fantasy series in its own right. It's about Lady Trent, who is a dragonologist, and it's, she's basically, if a Victorian woman were, if David Attenborough were a Victorian woman in a world where dragons existed. <laughs> um, if that sounds right up your street, definitely check out the series. I love the series, and book four was no different. And this one in particular, um, she's focusing on trying to breed dragons and she's working for a governmental program to do so. I can't go into crazy more detail than that because obviously it's book four and I don't want to spoil a bunch of things in the run up to it. But I would say that it's really like the character arc across the whole four books is incredible. There's some recurring characters who've come back who are just stunning. There is a whole romancy thing that is just chef's kisses all around. We had such a good time with this book. I smashed it in a day. Of course I did. I love this series and I'm heartbroken that I only have one left so obviously a five star rate for me
a technically a reread for me was what money can't buy by michael sandell this is a non-fiction and it's kind of a weird intersection between economics and ethics and i actually read some of it in my degree for some of my coursework in my final year um, i studied philosophy for those of you who don't know and i did this for a political philosophy essay um, basically the book is looking at what the moral limits of markets should be and are and the interaction between when you part money for a service or an item or a product the um, impact it has on the value and how we understand said product or service so it's looking at things like um, incentivizing certain behaviors and whether they have a way of corrupting that behavior the difference between incentives fees fines um, things like you know the standard kind of thing that gets banned around the internet of like a fine just means that it's uh, permissible for rich people to do it but like trying to break down those intuitions also looking at some things like what can and can't we um, buy both terms like of uh, logistically speaking but also in terms of what do we have an intuition against what should be for sale philosophy I've always said is really looking at our baseline intuitions and that real gut feeling but trying to put some kind of semblance of kind of logic and um, sort of objectivity over the top of it and looking at what we're really genuinely thinking when we have these gut intuitions that say to us oh we shouldn't do that or oh I don't like that or oh I don't but that doesn't feel like it's true and I think that this book does that very well. It's worth mentioning, you know, I was at uni quite a while ago now, we're starting to get a little old over here. This book was published in 2008, I believe, so it is obviously a little bit out of date in places, and in typical philosophical fashion, Michael Sandel's not actually putting forward any particular, um, like, strong conclusion. It's just a bunch of general musings about a lot of things to do with economics and ethics. However, if you do like that kind of thing, then it is going to be right up your street, and I do think it raises some very, very very interesting points that then can be extrapolated out to a lot of the stuff that's happening in the modern day so I do think it's still definitely worth a read it's also once you get your head around a couple of bit, little bits of jargon at the beginning which was a bit of a crash course kind of like okay I used to be able to know what these things mean yep there we go we've got that framework back in place well done brain actually then I breezed through it and it really wasn't that difficult to read so I would definitely still recommend it even if it isn't the most up-to-date or in-depth in this particular field so in the first half of the month I did decided to read a John Wyndham to my parents because I was going to lend it to my dad and obviously I didn't get a chance to before we went into lockdown so I decided to read it to him and my mum over like zoom calls every night. We did finish that in the first half of April so it then became my parents turn to pick a book and my dad picked The African Queen by C.S. Forrester as a classic romance tale to read to me and mum. This tells the tale of, um, so this was published in the 1930s and is looking at the First World War and particularly um, a Christian missionary who is over in Africa in the First World War when the Germans invade the area that she's in and so she ends up on a boat going down a river with um, one of the guys who kind of works in the area and it's about their madcap crazy plan to try and sail down some crazy rapids to blow up a boat that is like camping um, in a particular lake that is very important for like transit routes um, that's a German boat so that they can blow it up for um, the, the English to then be able to take control again. It's about their crazy tale and then also their budding romance in the middle. Um, without saying any spoilers it has one of the least satisfying endings I've ever experienced in a book and it has got a movie that was made which has got Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart I believe in it. Um, movie was made in like the 60s I want to say I'm not too sure I'll link it down below um, and apparently the movie is a lot better I've not actually seen it but my dad has and he says that the movie is far more satisfying at the end it kind of follows the book very closely and then with the bit where the book just plot wise tanks completely this one carries it home so potentially one not to bother reading and maybe just go watch it instead but it was good fun it was a nice classic it wasn't too horrendously like teeth gritting when it comes to either racism or sexism for the most part it was pretty good given it was written in the 30s and you know the descriptions of the jungle stuff was really entertaining so it was it was a solid three star read and amusing enough um for for kind of having it read to me uh we're now my partner is reading a Biggles book to us which is highly entertaining. Okay we're getting there we only have a couple of books left um a non-fiction that I finished towards the end of the month was The Golden Thread by Cassia St. Clair 
Uh, this is about a history of fabric and how fabric has had impacts in our development as a species across the years. I really enjoy this book. I think Cassia Sinclair did an amazing job at a micro history and I love these styles of books where it takes one particular thing and really focuses in on how that has impacted us across a wide range of time. Cassie Sinclair does an amazing job of following things like each individual chapter is a different kind of focal point in history. So we look at things like fabric and linen in um, Egyptian times and wrappings on mummies. It's looking at the Vikings and woolen sails and their importance in terms of allowing the Vikings the amount of travel that they had, the infamous Silk Road and the way that that encouraged trade between the West and the East and the various fortunes that were made across that. Things like lace in the Elizabethan era and then also moving forward to more modern times including rayon and the cost of speedy quick fashion that we have today, uh, the fabric that was taken into space and some really cool techie stuff that we're doing with spider silk these days and that might be the new frontier for fabric. I listened to this in audiobook and it was fine as an audiobook but I would probably actually recommend the physical one because the physical one does have some like quite good illustrations for various different like examples of how the weaves were described and things so if you're somebody who doesn't have a huge background in fabric you might need those like physical rep the, the drawing representations to kind of fully get what she's on about I do quite a lot of crafting so a lot of the descriptions of kind of fabric knit and weave did make sense because obviously I have like got a reference point already for it so depending on your background maybe pick up the physical book um, also it is just worth noting that there were the odd points where Cassie Sinclair made a throwaway comment that isn't strictly speaking the most 100% historically accurate. It was never about the fabric itself but more some of the background context where she made some very sweeping bold claims to set up like a general background historical noise of and kind of setting that having like read other things I know that is more of a sweeping generalization to how things actually were. The reason I say this is because there were quite a few complaints in the Goodreads reviews about this book that said that it was horribly historically inaccurate and that that threw doubt on like her credentials for the rest of it. I don't think it should go that far, I don't think it was that big a problem at all, I think it's more that she just made a few big sweeping statements about generally accepted views or potentially generally accepted at the time of writing that we may have a few more nuances to now that just helped to illustrate a point that she was trying to make without going into a crazy amount of detail because you know this is a micro history spanning a huge amount of time and all sorts of different countries and it's doing a lot of work so it does not have the space to be able to go into the amount of detail in some of the areas sometimes you just need a sentence and if that sentence isn't like a hundred percent bang on for example Exactly what we think now that's fine in my eyes um, but if you are a stickler for facts or if you're really 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 entrenched in history and know like a lot there might be a few points in this that you go not quite how it went down love but absolutely amazing stunning cover fantastic book adored it and the final book I want to talk about is actually five books that I'm going to talk about all in one because I read the first five books in the Midnight Breed series by Lara Adrian these are let's see if I can do this right Kiss of Midnight, Kiss of Crimson, uh, Midnight Awakening, Midnight Rising and Veil of Midnight. Clearly she couldn't decide at the beginning whether she was going to go for Kiss Of as the style or something to do with Midnight. I'm pleased that she went for Midnight. Kiss Of kept getting a bit boring. So these are a paranormal romance series of which there are 16 I believe in the series. I have actually read the first eight or nine. I can't quite remember. Um, a very long time ago I read them when I was a teenager and basically I was just in the mood for a reread. Um, off the back of my contemporary romance kick I was really enjoying kind of reading romance in general and I wanted to pick up a few more but I really couldn't be bothered to pick up anything new and I was getting feeling a little bit guilty about how much I was spending on my e-reader so I just decided to reread some stuff that I had. I really like the Breed series. It's basically um, a take on the classic vampire trope. The idea is that the vampires in the story are actually um, descendants of an alien race that crashed on our earth like a very long time ago and were these very savage monsters that then bred with humans that created the breed and with each generation that goes along the breed in them kind of sort of starts to lose, um, lose its sort of power and strength. Uh, there's a whole, as is kind of the classic with a paranormal romance, there's this big bad kind of thing happening in the background and then each book 
takes on an individual warrior from this particular um, order who are, who are tasked to fight the big bad who then meet their soulmate um, which they then end up bonded with and something happens to advance the overarching plot. So because of this they do start to get a little bit repetitive in places. You have a few of the classic kind of tropes of what you'd expect from your moody vampire heroes. You've got like the one with the anger management issue and the kind of torrid past. You've got like the wild playboy. You've got kind of the the one who is a bit reckless and is like a bit of a gun nut. It kind of keeps going from there. Um, and then equally you do have your fairly standard tropes in the women as well so it kind of follows on. I think they're really good fun, I have no problem with the series and I might, if I can be bothered, finish uh, both up to where I read to and then continue the series. The reason I stopped back when I was a teenager was because they were getting far too samey and actually once you've got past the first five to six you start to run out of characters who you cared about enough beforehand to then want to have an entire book on them because the premise only works if you keep introducing new warriors for new women to fall in love with but then you have all of these like other couples in the background that you feel that you still need to give some kind of airtime to because it's not really fair or realistic to just have like them the, this woman pop up and then disappear immediately because they're now integrated into the the society that they're part of so your cast of characters just keeps growing and growing and growing with no real way to do any of them any real justice anymore um so i can empathize with any author that takes on this particular style of writing which is fairly common in paranormal romance this like bouncing from couple to couple in a series from what i understand the series does like change where you get the next generation and it almost gives a way for the older one almost like a reset and a reboot while still staying in the same world so i think i was actually veering close to that and didn't quite get to the reset before i decided to tap out so i may continue reading a few more of them or i might just go back to reading animals books who knows um but i had a good time they're good fun and i think if you're looking for light-hearted entertaining books that are with a paranormal romance slant these are onto a solid winner. They're some of my favourite paranormal romance out there, as evidenced by the fact that I've reread them so many times. So I think that's it. Um, this has been one hell of a long wrap up uh, because it's just been a lot of reading at the moment with uh, me being on furlough. It's pretty much all I'm doing at the moment. So naturally the wrap up starts to get a little excessive. What from this list has made it onto your TBR? What do you think I should focus on next? Just, I don't know guys, comment down below. I went for a long bike ride and I'm now really tired. So I'm gonna go sit down and rest my tired legs. Chat to you soon. Have a wonderful reading week. Bye.